I think it's contains, it contains some truth in it, a lot of truth in it, uh, arguably. Say some truth is in there. Uh, yeah. Right, yeah. So you would, you would pick some things, but not others. Yeah, because the, the Quran presents itself yeah. as a Fukana criterion by which Muslims judge what uh, is true and what it may be as false in the uh, the previous scriptures as we have them now. So, it, it, yeah, that there's some things in the Bible I think which are, are, are true and valid. I mean, I personally love the Psalms. I think they're great. Uh, and a lot of the prophets, like uh, the prophets teach, like Jeremiah, Isaiah, yeah. Hosea, and so on. There's some, there's some wonderful stuff there. Uh, but there's other stuff where, where, for example, where the Bible seems to suggest there are many gods. There's not just one God. It's called henotheism, the idea that ours is the one true God, God of Israel, but that other gods exist. That's quite a common belief evidenced in the Jewish Bible. <clears throat> and Muslims would say, no, there is just one God, uh, the God of everyone. So that would be uh, an area where the Quran would seek to affirm the, the unity and oneness of God over against the belief there are many gods, which you find often mentioned in the Bible. So... Uh, yeah, yeah, I understand your point. Understand. But as regards Jesus, a Muslim, you, if you don't believe in Jesus as a Muslim, you're not a Muslim. You know, you, you must believe in Jesus. Mm. The, the Quran commands that. You don't recognize his divinity. Correct. Yeah. You see him as a prophet. Exactly. And indeed, there are passages in so, the. So do they believe that he resurrected? No, no. But they believe that God uh, took him up to heaven. God saved him and took him up to heaven. So uh, God. Uh, ex uh, obviously removed him from the danger of being crucified. There was a risk that, uh, that the Jews, some of the Jews or others wanted to crucify Jesus. The Quran says, no, he wasn't crucified, although it appeared that he was to, to them. Right. But in fact, God, God saved Jesus and took him right. to, to heaven. So that's so why he was without around. Without that, Islam doesn't have any answer to our sin. He doesn't have a way to redeem us from our sin. Because Christianity's message is that God came down Jesus Christ. Yeah. Is that, what you, is that what you believe, by the way? Is that your belief as well? Yeah. yeah. Right, okay. I'm Paul, by the way. All right, I'm Martin. Nice to meet you, Martin. Yeah. I, I didn't even ask what your faith was. I'm Muslim. Yeah, I, I imagine so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, we were introduced. But, uh, um, so, yeah, um, Muslims believe, and uh, uh, we believe, that uh, God doesn't require a sacrifice, human or otherwise, to forgive our sins. Uh, in Islam, God is most forgiving, most merciful. Uh, he forgives sins because that is his nature, if he pleases. So uh, he doesn't require a man to die. And indeed, the teaching of Jesus suggests that is the case. That Jesus said, uh, you know, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. He, uh, we can turn to him, like in the teaching of the Lord's Prayer, you go straight to God without any intermediaries, like whether it be Jesus or prophets or any other human beings, straight to God and asking his forgiveness. And that's in the Sermon on the Mount. So that, that's the... Uh, Islam obviously agrees with what Jesus teaches that, uh, about salvation. Um, okay. I don't have any questions really about Islam. I, I don't know much about it. So, do you have any questions about Islam at all? Are there any things that. Uh, because often people have misunderstandings, I'm not saying you do, not but really. they, uh, about... there's just nothing that ha has had me very convinced about it. Really. And most it is, I always look at the fruits of uh of faith right and i see that i don't see much of islam that compels me right well what do you, what do you see when you what, what, what do you see that islam that doesn't compel you what, well, what's your view it doesn't tend to create um, humility and uh, saint-like behavior wow um, i see more aggression right. more um, it makes people more narrow-minded right. And, um, do you have any? Do you have any Muslim friends? Not many. I, I have some, uh, some ex-Muslim friends. So right, right. Not many. So that's just what I've I've been um, receiving. Right. You see, it's interesting you say that, and I, I think many people in the West do have that perception. But the other side is that Muslims view the West and Westerners uh, and Christians as uh, as uh, warmongers, yeah. as people who. Uh, invade their countries, uh, often on pretexts, uh, yeah. false pretensions, on lies, kill lots of people, um, whether we see the, the sanctions against the, the Muslim people of Afghanistan at the moment, where literally thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of people are starving to death because the West are holding, the banks are holding money yeah. from that country, or whether we look at the, uh, the invasion of Iran, 
uh, uh, the, the, sorry, the attack on Iraq, I should say, uh, which had done on false pretenses that Saddam Hussein was somehow in league with Al Qaeda in 9 11. You know, and hundreds of thousands of people died because of a Christian leader, uh, Bush, and his colleague Blair, both committed devout Christians um, on their crusade, as Bush called it. And, um, you know, and, and these, these incursions, these invasions of Muslim countries have resulted in untold misery and death. And, and out of this hell, we saw ISIS come out of it, out of this chaos and disorder and destruction of Iraq. So when, when Muslims see the West, it's often these Christians think they have a God-given right to come into Muslim countries I know, I know, and, and, I... and, and destroy our states, our societies, our infrastructure, and it leads to chaos. And there's still chaos today yeah now so i th i agree with that th th there's really a problem but on both sides the muslims on that side yeah i see also the west as we're the evil festers it's babylon really and i understand their view of that and all of the, what they've done right. uh, but i don't necessarily but should we should we blame christianity for that do you think should we should, well, well when christian leaders who are prayerful uh, uh, george bush a born-again evangelical christian uh invaded Muslim countries, responsible for the deaths of countless people. Uh, Tony Blair was received into the Catholic Church. Yeah. Uh, you know, very pious, godly man, uh, lied to Parliament about Saddam Hussein's weapons of mass destruction coming to Britain in 40, 45 minutes or something, you know, mm. pretext for going in there. Should we hold these people to account for their faiths as well? Should, should, should we blame well, the KK, Christianity for the KKK? I, uh, of so, course so not. I, <clears throat> I don't really support the Christianity that we had in the West, Catholicism yeah. or uh, Protestantism. I, I support Orthodoxy, Eastern Orthodoxy. Ah, right. is that so, Russian or Greek or? Uh, Greek. You're Greek Orthodox. Yeah. Well, I'm a catechumen, so I'm not ah. baptized yet. Right. So you're seeking entrance into seeking entrance into yeah. the Greek Orthodox Church. Yeah. So wow. I'm, I'm just learning that as well. Right. But that is because I've been disillusioned with the Western Christianity that we have, and uh, see that. Yeah, I believe the faith in God is something of the heart, something of the right. soul, and not of the mind. Right. And what I see is that many faiths, especially Protestantism, has become very intellectual. It has taken on the secular intellectual <clears throat> yeah. mindset that we have nowadays. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why we're everyone talking, screaming at one another. Yeah, yeah. Where the hearts are, are the, yeah, cold. No, I, I, I see. I see. No, I, I think that's a very good point. Uh, I, I mean, my, my own experience. Well, when I the Muslims, I. Muslims, what, they're 1.9, maybe 2 billion Muslims on Earth. There's a lot of Muslims on Earth. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, just are. Some Muslims are, 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 you know, are not good people. You know, but the most Muslims I've met, uh, particularly the devout Muslims, are humble people who mm. love God, love their Creator, uh, who are phenomenally generous in charity. In fact, the, the number one charity givers in the UK, according to a recent survey in the Times, are Muslims. They give more in charity than any other group, including Jews, Christians, atheists. They're phenomenally generous with charity. This is to the public, not just charity to other Muslims, so to you know, yeah. uh, general ch charities. So, so the, mo the more committed Muslims, in my experience, are to faith, to their Lord, uh, and to practicing their faith. That's the prayer and fasting uh, and giving in charity. They're the more humble and the more neighborly and the more uh, good, good people they are. That's my experience. But there are some, there, there are some fanatics. Yes, uh, I don't, I don't doubt that. Uh, I've even seen some of them. But they don't tend to be the majority. They tend to be a um, thank goodness, a minority. A any more than the the KKK or Ku Klux Klan or the yeah. or the extremists who who are banging the drums of war to go into Muslim countries and, and yeah. take them over and liberate them by liberate them into hellfire, basically. That's, that's, what, that's what happened. Yeah. Anymore, I blame uh, Jesus Christ for that. Mm. I don't blame Jesus for that. But Jesus was a, a, a noble, godly prophet of God, messenger who was sent to uh, you know, bring the, the good news of the gospel yeah. to, to, to people. So I don't blame Jesus for that. Uh, Any more than I blame God or the last prophet of God, uh, the last prophet of God, Muhammad, upon whom Jesus. I don't blame him for that either. The bad things that some Muslims do. So, uh, but I think I, I think one of the issues between Islam and Christianity is to do with Jesus being God, uh, and that I think so the, the Gospels, when, when, I, when I see them, that they depict a man who is praying to God. It says at the beginning of Mark that Jesus went out into before the dawn, before daybreak, and prayed to God. 
as she says that. Um, and he is a man that Muslims recognise as a godly man. But Christians, the, the I, I'm afraid mm. they they might fail to see his divinity. Right. That he came down to save us from our sins. Right. Pretty much, and to give us our way into to heaven, to salvation, to save us from our sin, to save us from the horrible death that we are in. So. Is, is God immortal? Is God someone who dies or is he someone who doesn't die? Well, I don't know that. I'm just a human. But okay. What does the Bible say? The, the Bible immortal. does... God is mortal, yes. God is mortal. He dies. Not immortal. Oh, immortal. Exactly. It actually says that in the Bible, in 1 Timothy. It says God is immortal. Yes. So he doesn't die. So who died on the cross? That was the body of Jesus Christ. The body? Yeah. Right. So Jesus Christ was of man, of God. Right. But we are truly God and fully man. So it wasn't Jesus' deity that died, in your view, it was his humanity that died on the cross? Yes. Right. So why would God require then a human sacrifice, which by the way the Bible condemns in many places as an abomination, why would God then require that in some way to allow him to forgive our sins? I don't quite understand the logic of that. Well, I'm, I'm very new to Christianity. Yes, very okay. few years. But okay. it, I've heard that it comes back to, if you look at the Old Testament, how they used to offer um, allowance for the sins. Right. And all that. Yes. And they had to fulfill the law. The right. Jewish law. <clears throat> okay. And Jesus came as the final sacrifice to wipe out that law. To fulfill it. Fulfill it. Okay. Now, in, in these, uh, the book of Leviticus is part of the Pentateuch, part of the Torah in the, in the, in the Jewish Bible. Uh, the early chapters talk about the sacrifices to be offered in the temple. So Leviticus chapter 1, the chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4 and chapter 5 are all to do with the sacrifices in the temple. And, and they're to do with uh, their thanksgiving offerings. So if you were giving thanks to God, you could offer a sacrifice. There were other kinds of, there were many different kinds of offerings that one could offer in the temple. And in chapters 4 and 5, you get sin offerings. So now we now move into the, where sacrifices are for sin. And it's very clear because the chapter re repeats it repeatedly that the uh, the sin offerings are for inadvertent sins, unintentional sins. So if you unintentionally sin, if you inadvertently do this, if you didn't intend to but you did that, yeah. this is the sacrifice you offer. For intentional sins, there is no provision given for of, of, a, of a sacrifice of an animal. I just invite, I mean, not to do this now, but invite you to go look at the Bible and read the passages, Leviticus chapters 4, 5, 6, which talk about sin offerings, a sacrifice. So it's not for deliberate sin. So what happens if you deliberately sin? You deliberately sin, and you're an Israelite. What do you do? Well, according to, I think it's Numbers chapter, chapter 25, you repent. You repent of your sins. You repent. Do tauba, as they say in Arabic. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, sometimes people ask, well, what's an inadvertent sin? What's an accident? How can you accidentally commit a sin? Well, an example would be, say if you're an Israelite and you... Uh, well, we don't have as much control over ourselves as we think we do. Well, true, but... Uh, many, uh, many things we do. Okay. There are many things you, you might do inadvertently which are sinful, uh, so that's when you go to... Uh, but if it's in deliberate, there, there, there is really a, a, a sin offering mentioned in the book of Leviticus. And, there are, and these are sin offerings in the temple, by the way, which are of... Specifically, you know, animals or turtle doves, it mentioned pigeons and so on. There's certain things you can give. Um, but human sacrifice is completely pro pro prohibited. There, there are passages in, in Deuteronomy and other places where human sacrifice is absolutely ruled out by God. You shall not do as other nations do. You shall not sacrifice your children, your sons and your daughters to Moloch. You don't, this is all wrong. So human sacrifice is just a no-no in the people of God, in, in Israelites. If they are offering sacrifices, it's for certain kinds of sins, and then you're offering sheep or sometimes turtle dove, depending on the sin is. Right. So that teaches a lot about what God's ways are here. So the idea of the Messiah dying for sins is is not ex there's nowhere in the Jewish Bible that expectation doesn't exist. There's no passage in the Jewish Bible where any prophet says the Messiah will die for this will suffer and die for the sins of the world and be raised again on the third on the third day, which is the claim of Christian claim. It's just not there in the Jewish prophets. Um, so the idea that then that this, the uh, the Messiah would die and uh, be a sacrifice 
is not part of Judaism. It's not part of the Israelite faith. So it's a new, a new idea. Oh, well, sorry, I heard your voice. I said, is that Portland? I mean, that's... How are you doing? You're right. oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, please. Um, well, the Jews were expecting a Messiah. They were. But what were they expecting? That's a great... Excellent. So, uh, what Messiah were the Jews... Isaiah 53? I think it's Isaiah 53. Yeah. It's interesting. Isaiah 53 doesn't mention a Messiah. It just doesn't mention a Messiah. I mean, literally, it doesn't mention a Messiah anywhere. And uh, um, so it's not... Uh, mind it, uh, no, no, yeah, never mind. Isaiah 53 doesn't mention, maybe not mention a Messiah. No. But the, well, what was the expectation of the Messiah? Well, what would he do then, according to Judaism, both now and in the Second Temple period? Do, what were the Israelites expecting the Messiah to be like, do you think? What was he supposed to do when he comes? The Messiah comes along. Well, who is he? What does like he do? A king, a conqueror, right? Yeah, a king they like. So they expected someone to come here on the earth and create a kingdom on the earth. A king like David, perhaps. Yeah, I was. I was exactly. Sure. Well, yeah, in fact, a king like David. King David was a great king in Israel. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, he fought his enemies. He was victorious. He ruled. There was one nation then under David, and the Davidic king. Uh, is a type of the Messiah, and he was anointed. That's what Messiah means, by the way. Mm. And there are a number of Messiahs in the Bible, not just uh, David. David was anointed. Uh, Cyrus, the pagan, uh, non-Jewish Gentile, King Cyrus, was called, is called the Messiah in Isaiah. So there are even non-Jewish Messiahs already existing in the Jewish period. So, but according to Christianity, of course, Jesus was horribly tortured to death uh, and killed in a very horrible way by the Romans on the cross so that's not what they were expecting to happen no. the Jews so that's why Jews I think don't believe in the Christian Messiah because it's not what they're hoping for yeah. according no, to their exactly, own scriptures exactly. but that was yeah. Isaiah 53 which is a chapter which I <laughs> I've heard the Jews don't really like to talk about the read. You know. well, the Jews the here, the, the Jews here love to talk about Isaiah okay. 53. There, there's the, there's the, a Jew the, over there. The they can introduce you to who will talk to you about yeah, Isaiah yeah. 53. Because it kind, yeah. it, it kind of almost describes that someone exactly like Jesus is going to come and really? be beaten and tortured and, and, and died for their transgressions. Okay. The thing about Isaiah 53, the the, the consensus of most scholars, historians, Old Testament scholars today, is I is Isaiah 53 is the fourth of four servant songs. Now these are passages in Isaiah, uh, beginning I think it's Isaiah 46, it goes on Isaiah 49, and Isaiah 51, and Isaiah 53, uh, where the servant, the servant who is, is called the servant, is explicitly identified as Israel itself. Israel is the servant of God in these passages. So if you're reading Isaiah as it flows, the narrative, as it goes to chapter after chapter, and you get to Isaiah 53, you already know what the Susan servant is, because it mentions him, this figure, poetically called the Messiah, uh, called the servant, I should say. Um, Messiah is not mentioned, as I've already said, in, in these passages. Um, so when you hit Isaiah 53, you know what's been spoken about, because you've read the preceding chapters. It's Israel, and it's Israel in exile in Babylon, because that's what the story is about. Yeah. And and their suffering, and the way that the world will look on them and be horrified at the, their, their terrible plight, they've been abandoned, and so on. But, and then the story goes on. It's a very figurative, poetic way of talking about Israel's plight in Babylon, in the exile, in about five 600 BC. That's kind of what most historians, when they read that passage in its context, understand to be what's going on. If you parachute down as a Christian into that and ignore all the context and you have your Christological glasses focused on Jesus, you know, looking for Jesus, you'll see Jesus. Of course you will. Absolutely. Because you're looking to see Jesus there already and you're ignoring any of the contextual indicators of the meaning of that passage, like who the, who the servant is, because it's also identified as Israel. Um, but it's interesting that Isaiah it doesn't mention Messiah doesn't mention Jesus. It doesn't mention a person dying and rising again from the dead either. It doesn't say this person died, if it is an individual, died and rose again. Yeah. It's kind of quite elusive and poetic but, and... Yeah, but does everything has to come from prophets? Because there's many things that has happened, miracles and things that, was, that the prophets didn't write about. And we have a lot of the writings from the apostles and things that actually that, that witnessed him. What the miracles? His miracles. Well, they witnessed him after, yeah, the resurrection and other oh, resurrection. And, that, and God, God answers from it. And they, they were willing to die and go for persecution. They went through 
very horrible things. The, the early followers. Well, of okay, well, did it, well, who did Peter think Jesus? Is it Peter? He's the chief of the apostles. Uh, so who, who did Peter? I, I don't mean during the Gospels. So, so what I mean is, according to Acts, beginning of Acts, after Jesus ascended to heaven, Muslims agree Jesus ascended to heaven. We all agree he left the scene. Peter then preaches to Israel, to the Israelites, in Acts chapter 2, verse 22, telling them who Jesus is. Okay. And I happen to agree with Peter. He says, Israelites, men, men, men of Israel, Israelites, listen to this. Jesus, so he knows who Peter is, but he's full of the Holy Spirit. Jesus was a man attested by God through whom God did signs and wonders amongst you, as you yourselves know. That's literally a verbatim quote from the English, anyway. Um, so, Jesus was a man through whom God did signs and wonders, a, a, a man accredited by God through whom God did signs and wonders amongst you, as you yourselves know. So we know he's a man, that he is God's man, God did miracles through him, you yourselves saw the miracles. No, Christ is not only a man. Ah. He is also he is both God and both man. He's a part of the Trinity. I, I, I get I get that, but I'm yes. quoting Peter here, by the way. Okay. I'm quoting him after the ascension, so it's after all of these things happened. Yeah. Jesus left the scene. Peter's full of the Holy Spirit. We've already had Pentecost. Peter gives it to them straight. Jesus was a man accredited by God, through whom he did signs and wonders, miracles amongst you, as you yourselves know. Peter doesn't mention the Trinity, he doesn't mention incarnation, he doesn't say Jesus is God or divine in any sense at all. Um, and I think Peter, Peter's probably right. He, I mean, he knew Jesus, spent some time with him, perhaps. And, uh, well, but the apostles were human as well. Many of them didn't even see him, they didn't even know yeah. who he was when they were with him all the time. And he, he did miracles upon them and they would like yeah. to see, they couldn't see his divinity right. for a while, you know. So they, they, they didn't know everything, I would imagine. No, but Peter says that God was working through oh, sorry, sorry. Jesus. Uh, like prophets do, God works uh, through the prophets. No, the, the, some more, of them had... no, Christ was divine. Right. Christ had a divine nature. So he wasn't only working through him. Okay. So, who is God? God, God we've already agreed, is immortal. He doesn't die. God also knows everything, doesn't he? He's the truth. Yeah, he's the truth. But God also knows all things. So he's omniscient. He's all powerful. Yeah. Muslims and Christians and Jews all agree on this. So we've already seen that God, Jesus died, but he was immortal. That God is immortal. We kind of touched that briefly. God knows everything. Did Jesus know everything? Did he know all things? I don't know. I can't answer that. Okay, well, he I, probably did. I can. I no, I can answer that for you because he says in the Gospels uh, about the date of the hour, Mark 13, to be precise. No one knows the date of the hour. You know when when it's going to happen. Neither the Son nor the angels. No one. Only God in heaven. Only the Father in heaven. He explicitly says the Father doesn't know. Uh, sorry, the Son, the Son, nor the Son, nor the angels. No one knows apart from the Father when the hour will be, the date of the end. So he confesses his ignorance about a date. So he doesn't know everything. According to Jesus' own confession, he doesn't know everything. He's not omniscient. Therefore, he, he is not God. We've already uh, uh, agreed that God is omniscient, knows all things. The other thing, God is all-powerful. God created the heavens and the earth. That nothing can overcome God's will. He, he has dominion over all things. But Jesus didn't. Uh, according to the Gospels, he got tired. Um, he, 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 he was human. Yeah. Yeah, he was human as, as us. He, he, he um, you know, suffered. You know, the devil came to him as well and tried to tempt him. Yeah. Just as us. So, the devil tried to tempt Jesus. So, do you think God can be tempted by the devil? No, Jesus, I don't think Jesus was tempted. Right. So, Jesus wasn't tempted then? No. But you just said he no, was. He re no, right. oh, no, okay. no, I said right. the devil tried to. Right, so the devil didn't know who he was dealing with then. The devil didn't know this person was divine. Well, the devil, I'm pretty sure the devil knows. I agree. So why was he trying to tempt God when he knew anyway that God couldn't be tempted? Well, I'm not sure the devil knew that. Oh, we didn't know that. Oh, no. no I, I'm, not, I'm not sure. Oh, okay. No, I, I thought it the devil, say, well, what, what, uh, the living, devil on, living on the know. supernatural plane, if you like, would know if he was encountering God, yeah, yeah. The devil would know that he was encountering God. It wouldn't just be fooled by a veil of flesh. Oh, it looks like a human being. He, he wouldn't be able to detect it was, it was... Well, it was the Son of God that he... 
time. Right. But he was, well, he, he was, had a human, he knew it, right. had a human body. Right. He, he had, you know, this is us. But he didn't sin. No. No, it's just, according to the Gospels, Jesus literally, sorry, Satan literally took Jesus to the top of the mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and says, you can have all of these if you just bow down and worship me. Satan says that. But he didn't realize who he was talking to, clearly. Yeah. He didn't realize he was talking to what you would call a divine being. But the demons knew in the Gospels that they recognized who Jesus was. Mm. You are the Holy One of God, which means, doesn't mean God, by the way, it just means that. So that's a bit of a confusing thing. So, so Jesus, according to Mark 13, didn't know the day to the end. Um, he was not immortal, he died. And he wasn't all powerful because it, in, in Mark it also says Jesus on the cross, and Jesus says, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? That's very weak. He, he feels that he's been abandoned by God and he cries out in despair. And that's a supreme weakness and vulnerability there. Yeah, humility, meekness. But also weakness, he doesn't know. He's, he's, as another example of ignorance, he says, my God, my God, to why have you... withstand all of that knowing that Jesus knew what was going to happen to him. He, he went through it anyway. So why is he saying to God, I my God, my God, why, ha why have you, met. but why have you abandoned me? He, he doesn't understand, at least the way it's presented in the Gospels, why he has been abandoned. He just doesn't, he just feels forsaken. He feels lost. Uh, well, that, that's, that's, I'm, not, I'm not a theologian, but I'm okay. pretty sure that that, state, that what he said connects uh, something from the, what the prophets had said as well. So you something to do with that. Well, it's a quote from the psalm. I think it's yeah. Psalm 22, where David is saying, my God, my yeah, God. Yeah. But that's David. D David was just a human being. He wasn't God, obviously. Um, so... No, but couldn't the psalms be a prophetic text? They could Isn't be. But I do think that psalm was prophetic. It's just recording David's oh, despair. You don't believe it's prophetic? Well, it doesn't claim to be prophetic. It's not saying it's prophetic. It's just recording David's despair. It's not saying this is a prophecy of the Messiah to come and he will say this. It's just saying David said this. Right. It's not prophetic. Well, It's just a psalm. It could be prophetic. If there's a lot of things that the psalms describe that then later happen in the New Testament, it becomes prophetic. Unless the gospel writers copied the, the, those verses and put them in Jesus' text. mouth, unless retrospectively they added the verses to the psalm story to make it look as if there's some correspondence because they could have done that it, it could be the other way around they could have retro retrofitted it to make it look as if yeah, yeah, I, know, yeah. I, know, I know that argument uh, yeah, they, 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 they could have done that uh, that's possible and indeed many scholars think that's exactly what happened well, I'm pretty sure <laughs> that the, the Dead Sea Scrolls kind of confirmed that that, oh, yeah. that was the Dead Sea Scrolls yeah so well, what do they confirm sorry that that was written before um, the New Testament. What was written for the New Testament? The, well, so I, I'm talking way beyond all my own knowledge there, but uh, no, I'm just, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's what it were. That's what they confirmed. Okay, well, the Dead Sea Scrolls basically t took our dating of manuscripts back a thousand years. Mm -hmm. So the oldest ones we have were about 10, 11th century AD, and now we've got s scrolls that go back to the time of Christ or just before that. I think the oldest one, the, one of the oldest ones, is the Isaiah Scroll which is about 1 or 2 BC, yeah? But Isaiah himself lived many centuries before that, and Moses lived a thousand years. Abraham, I mean, we're talking this, the gap between the events they purport to describe in the Bible and the manuscripts is still huge, many, many centuries, eight, nine hundred years gap between, say, the, Pentateuch, the Torah and the earliest manuscripts we have. And we have no way of knowing if uh, the manuscripts have been preserved reliably, faithfully intact. Yeah, they could have been changed. They could have yeah. been changed. Um, we just simply, so that, simply, simply don't know. Yeah. We can't say. And that's one that's of the reasons why, why the Quran sees itself as a, a way of discerning, discriminating between what is what is authentic and true in in the existing scriptures of the people of the book, the Jews and the Christians, and what has been falsified or changed or corrupted by them or forgotten. Yeah. The, the Quran accuses the Jews and Christians of of changing and manipulating their scriptures, adding stuff, forgetting yeah. things and so on. So the scripture we have today are not the original Torah, for example, that we have that we have that Moses was given, I should say, on Mount Sinai. That that's one of the problems. You see that's why I don't fully agree with the argument of Sola Scriptura, which some yeah. Christians say. Yeah. The Bible was created many years, hundreds of years after Jesus' death. But, um, well, from the uh, Orthodox perspective, that we have tradition that we've kept. And, Whoa. Uh, Whoa. 
Yes. And we had the, the saints and the writings of them that had continued on the tradition from yes. Jesus and the apostles. Yes. Uh, because, firstly, for me, um, just arguments on a text kind of misses uh, the point of the salvation of our soul. Right. That if our heart isn't changed, if our heart isn't filled with God's love, then I don't think we know God at all. And I could know every kind of uh, text there is. But if I, if I don't know God in my heart, then um, how, can I, how can I claim that I know the right the right life? But, but we've already, I, I, I think, I've presented reasons why I think the Christian identification of Jesus as God is, is, is mistaken. Because Jesus wasn't all-powerful, he didn't know everything, and he wasn't immortal. He died, he, d he confessed his ignorance, and he was clearly very weak and not all-powerful. Uh, in, in many situations I in his life. I would say he was the so, most bravest man I, I've ever, that ever existed. But he didn't face his death very bravely, according to the gospel. So, I, I know many men who, uh, who have faced death. How, how would deaths. you have faced that death if you knew? Many men have faced... Think, Socrates, almost, Socrates, for example. Facing certain death. Socrates. Yeah, he was a very brave man as well. But no, but he was much braver, much braver than the way Jesus... Excruciating torture. All his friends abandoned him. Everyone abandoned him. The, the people hated him. He was innocent. He had only done good things. They cheered on to let a, um, a murderer, a criminal, lose instead of him. They knew there, everything was going to happen. There, 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 are lots of, there are lots of great men in Islamic history and, and other religions who have faced terrible death without abandoning their faith in God. I'm, I'm, in, pretty, I'm in, pretty sure you haven't seen much. No, no, there, there, are, there, are people, there are people in the Islamic tradition who are horribly tortured um, uh, for their faith uh, uh, who didn't abandon belief in God. Now, I don't believe, by the way, that what the Gospels say about Jesus is historically accurate in this regard. So I'm not criticizing Jesus. I'm saying that the way the Gospels portray Jesus presents him as a man who lost his faith in God. He said at one point, according to the Gospels, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? This is not the man of, a pi of piety, of great faith in God. He lost his faith. He, he, he basically gave up. And he's not a role model, biblically, for anyone. I wouldn't say he gave up because he fulfilled what he was said to do. But he, okay, I'm just quoting the words that Jesus were given to right. Jesus in Mark. I'm right. not well, making I'm, it up. I'm not, sure I'm not you, making it you up. You are interpreting them right. Okay, I'm, not saying, how, I'm not saying I. How should I interpret them? How should I interpret them? But I'm, I'm not sure you are interpreting them. Okay, okay, but, but, but let's, let's, let's go you, back you to an earlier. You the divinity of Christ by that, like the Jews who couldn't see. Yeah. who he was, that he did everything for love. It's all for love, those people that killed him. Well, before, before okay, let's go before the cross, uh, the day before, he uh, on uh, in Gethsemane, the story where, where Jesus got down and bowed down and begged God to take away this, this suffering that he was, uh, it looked like he was going to have to go through. Although Muslims believe actually God answered his prayer and said, and rescued him and saved Jesus and took him to heaven. So Muslims believe God answered Jesus' prayer and rescued him. But in, in, the, in the, the Christian story, of course, he begged to, to have this cup of suffering taken away. God refused his prayer and basically said no. Jesus goes to the cross, dies horribly and, and loses his faith. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? He doesn't know anymore what's happening to him and he gives up faith. Um, no, he knew. He prayed just before all this was going to happen, and he even prayed to be uh, saved from it. But he said, "But he was Your will be done, not mine." Yes, not mine. But so his will was that he should see. There was a disagreement yeah, he between. He was human as us. He had pain. Yeah. He had anxiety. Yeah. He had yeah. Suffering like that. So and Jesus' will was that he wouldn't go through with this, but God didn't answer that prayer in the way he wanted. But Muslims say God did answer that prayer positively yeah. and rescued Jesus. I understand. I can understand what the Muslims would see him as weak because they offered this a warlord. They believe in strength. A warlord? And, yeah. Okay. Muhammad was a warlord. What, what do you mean a warlord? Well, that's uh, just what I know. They, they give, me, give, give, me, give, well, give me an example of, a, of his being a warlord, of Muhammad's being a warlord. No, I, I haven't read the Quran, I don't know that. But that, Wait, that's why I haven't heard of it. And I'm pretty okay. sure. Oh, so you don't know? You know you, I'm pretty sure you know. What well, it is, I, I, no, honestly, I, I've read a little bit about his life and his teaching, yeah. Muhammad, peace upon him, and I've not come across him being a warlord he ever. quite a lot of people, right, and took slaves. S such as? Such as. I, I don't have you don't know. the names or anything. No, no I don't I'm not a theologian. 
No, I'm not. I'm not a theologian either. We're just talking about Muhammad's no, life. Here. You don't have to be a theologian. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. Tell me then. How okay. Was. Well, Muhammad was many things. He uh, he excelled in many areas. He was obviously a prophet of God, but also he was a head of state. So he uh, in Medina, uh, he he was uh, uh, invited to become. Uh, the, the, the governor, the king, the ruler, the head of state in Medina. Uh, he certainly had an army. Um, he was a father, he was a statesman, he was a lawgiver um, and a judge and so on and so on. He, he, he excelled in many, many roles in his life. Um, the closest biblical parable would be someone like Moses. Moses also was a lawgiver, a prophet, a head of state, a father, a statesman, a judge and so on. The, the parallels between the life of Moses, Moses a prophet are very similar. He didn't start wars and go out conquering. He, he rescued his people. No. Ma Ma all of Muhammad's uh, 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 military battles were defensive in nature. He never initiated unprovoked aggression on anyone. So if you go through the battles, Battle of Badr was the first one. Well, why did that happen? Why, did, why was Muhammad involved in the Battle of Badr? Because the Meccans came after him. Why did the Meccans come after him? Because he was preaching exactly the same message that the biblical prophets were preaching. And what is that? There is one God. That's, I mean, this is this is the scandal of Muhammad, is that he was preaching exactly what Jeremiah preached, Isaiah, Moses, all of the Jewish prophets preached the same message: the oneness of God, the unity of God, and also that you should be kind to orphans. And also, his earlier surahs, which are in the towards the end of the Bible, uh, the Quran in our English translations, they say things. What does God want you to do? He wants you to free slaves. He wants you to be just to people, to, to support the poor, the orphans, to give to the wayfarer, the needy, to the stranger. It goes on and on like this, incredible stuff, which you find in the Bible too. As long too. as they have the same faith. No, it doesn't well, say that. No, no, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say that. But well, it, this is in yeah. Mecca, remember? This is in Mecca. He's telling, he's telling, uh, he's, he's preaching this to people. Release slaves. Be, be kind, be just to the does, widow, does and, and the so on. say that they should conquer by sword and take no. over and no. behead the infidels? There is no conquer by sword. No. There, uh, no. You're pretty sure because you probably read it in the Daily Mail or the Sun no, newspaper no, I, I, or I, CNN or Fox well, News. At some point. About Indonesia and Malaysia. Uh, no, no, okay. So not, nobody go fight them. And, no, no, no. Become Muslim. No, no, no. Oh, how about the Russian people? Some people. Yeah, yeah. How about I'm, people in America? Uh, nobody. I'm not saying that's the only way, but I'm saying they, I'm saying you have that. If you go, if you go through the battles, in, in, I mentioned B Bada and there are other ones. Yeah. They are defensive in nature, where he is uh, being pursued by the pagans, by main, mainly by the Meccans, and sometimes by their allies. The Battle of the Trench, probably the last big one that he was involved with. It was the Meccans with some of their allies who came up to Medina yeah. to try and destroy Islam, destroy Muhammad, destroy him. They lost, by the way, but not a single person was killed because, I mean, you know this story, I won't go into details. It, 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 it turned out the Meccans withdrew and they went home. Now, this is the crucial test. So Muhammad is a warlord, he's a terrible man. Okay, so he went back and he conquered Mecca, which he did. He conquered Mecca. He went back and he took Mecca. He slaughtered his enemies, didn't he? He went in and he killed the Meccans. He took vengeance on his enemies in Mecca, didn't he? No, he didn't. He didn't. From the position of power and dominance, he, he behaved like Joseph. And he actually says this, he says this in the Quran. You know Joseph in the Bible? Joseph, of course, was the second to the fair, second to the king in Egypt. You know the story of Joseph in the Bible? Yeah. 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 So his brothers, finally knowing who he is, having done the terrible thing, having kidnapped, well, having abandoned him and sold him to slave traders and done for dead or whatever. What did Joseph do to his brothers? He killed them, of course, didn't he? Of course, he was a righteous man. He could have slaughtered his brothers because they did evil. No, he, 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 he should, he should, he, no, he didn't. Joseph didn't kill him. That's the point, that's the point, that's the point. So Joseph, when he was a position of total power in the state of Egypt, he showed mercy and forgiveness to his brothers who had wronged him so terribly. And the Quran says, this is what, Muhammad, I'm paraphrasing, this is exactly the way Muhammad treated his enemies when he could have exterminated them in Mecca. He showed them forgiveness from position of power. Now, this says a lot about the character of the man, the real character, I mean, not the character that West, some Western people have of Muhammad as a warlord. Because if he was a warlord, he would destroy his enemies. People who killed his family, Hamza, his uncle, 
was horribly mutilated and his, his liver was eaten by one of, I mean, you know. The person who did that was not murdered, was not executed. They were, they were ultimately forgiven. Okay. So, um, now, but there the were examples where he did go to war and people were killed, but these were always defensive wars. They were never, he never initiated wars like George Bush did or Tony yeah. Blair, who on a false pretext invades Muslim countries, literally slaughters hundreds of thousands of innocent men, women and children on a lie. And these are, these are devout Christians who have never been prosecuted for their crimes, ever. No court, worldly court, has ever held them to account. Anyway, enough about that. So coming back to uh, a man who did show mercy and, and forgiveness from position of power, Muhammad, I think that is a great example for all of mankind that, uh, of mercy. And indeed, the Quran says, you have been sent as a mercy to mankind. Interesting. The Quran actually says, you have been sent as a mercy to mankind. And if you look at this brother was saying, the biggest, what's the biggest Muslim country on earth today? I mean... It's the biggest Muslim country on, in the world today. Saudi Arabia? Could be. No, what is it? China, India. Indonesia. Indonesia Muslim India, country. India. Muslim country. Yeah. Indonesia is the biggest Muslim country. Hundreds of millions of people. It was conquered by the Muslims, wasn't it? They went in there with the sword, took over the country. No? Oh, they didn't. Oh, my but goodness me. How can that be? How can that be? No, they were all peacefully converted, literally, by Muslim traders, businessmen, just people who did dawah, as it's called, who went into Indonesia. And now the, Muslim, the whole of that country is completely, well, virtually completely Muslim through peaceful conversion. And it's the largest Muslim country in the world. There's never an army's been there. What? Muslim, sorry, Christian armies have been there. Lots of Christian armies have been there to conquer, but not a single Muslim army has ever been there to conquer. This is a reality. This is a reality. It's not necessarily what you've heard on CNN or Fox News or from the BBC or whatever. It's. Uh... I'm sorry, I'm interrupting you. But Please. I'm going to uh, add something. My English is not that good, but he's, he's doing a really good job. I like it. But uh, it does. Uh, the tribe in Europe that time when Sheikh Prophet Muhammad tried to, he, as you said, he's a warrior. He's a, he's a, a warrior, something like that. He, they, they came to him, the tribe, tell him, you, you be, we give you the money, you be our king. He refused it. That doesn't mean he went, he went uh, how can you explain that when the, the tribes came to them and asked him to be their, uh, their king and their, they give him the wealth and they rejected because he, have the, he came for the, uh, as a messenger, not to become a, as a warrior, to become a king. Even when Paul was talking about when they entered back to Mecca with the army, they expected Muhammad to be walking like an Arabic way. He was literally walking, his head was down. Yeah. And like, can you can imagine with all the power, all this humbleness and all, he was looking down. Then as uh, Paul said, they asked him, he said, what do you think I'm going to do for you? Then some of them thought that he's going to kill them. He said, I'm going to forgive you as my use, my brother Yusuf did with his brother. Joseph. So it yeah. was the same Joseph. Yeah. yeah. yeah it's the same. Okay. Yeah. So here we, here we have a prophet, one prophet, an Arab prophet, consciously following the example of, a, of an Israelite, a Jewish prophet, Joseph, in the Bible, in his behavior. That's a man of God, isn't it? If you're copying the, the noble, godly example of Joseph, that's a man of God doing that, isn't it? Muhammad, a man of God. I, I mean, yeah, it just seems obvious to me. If, if, you, if, if you take away our prejudices for a second and just look at the actual evidence, you know, a man who behaves like that, when he could have slaughtered her, he had every reason to get revenge and justice and vengeance. He didn't do that. He could have done easily. No one would have stopped him, and he didn't. And he followed the example of another prophet, Joseph. That's, I mean, that, that says it all. That says it all. What evidence, what evidence do we need? Did he, ta did he preach the same thing that Joseph preached? One God. Did he believe in the God of Israel? Muhammad believed in the God of Israel. The Quran constantly says that. Believe in the God of, of Moses, of Noah, of Jesus, Isa. Believe in this, this same God. Yeah. It's not a different God. They're pointing. Muslims are pointing to the God that Israel worships as the same God that Muslims worship yeah. explicitly. So what, what's the, what's, what is the issue? Yeah, they, he might have been a very religious good man, but how, how does that help us prove that Quran, the Quran or Islam is the way to the truth? Okay. The, the knowledge of truth. Okay. How does that convert our souls, heal our hearts? 
Okay. There, there is a lot of miracles there. There is a lot of okay. science things. Mission in Quran. J J what about the past and the present and the future? Yeah. So uh, there, there is a lot of. Uh, sorry what, about the I'm just I know. What, what What is the message that they all preached? A, a man came, according to the Gospels, a man came to Jesus and says, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? This is Matthew chapter, uh, Matthew chapter uh, yeah. 17. Sorry, but we were, chapter 10, verse 17 and 18. Jesus says, Why do you call me good? There's no one good but God alone. And then he says to obey the commandments, and he lists them, five of them. Uh, and uh, the man says, I've obeyed all those since I was a youth. Jesus said, you lack one thing. Go and sell all your wealth, all your treasure, and you have treasure in heaven. The one thing he lacked is the treasure was an issue. What Jesus didn't say was, you put your faith in me as your dying and raising, rising saviour, and I will forgive your sins. He said, basically, be a good Jew. In, in the same gospel, he was asked, Jesus was asked, what is the greatest well, it says commandment? In John 3, so yeah. whoever believes in him will in turn, in, yeah. inherit eternal life. Well, Muslims must believe in Jesus as well. Depends what you mean by believe. What's the content of that belief? Jesus was also asked another occasion in Mark, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus answered. This is a really good point. Yeah. Like, what is, what is the belief? So, what is the greatest commandment according well, to Jesus? Yeah. So Jesus said, here's this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one, one Lord. Now that's quoting from the Shema in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. So this tells us that the oneness of God is the greatest commandment. That's also the commandment in Islam, that you believe that there is no God but God, with no partners. Yep. Yeah? It's exactly the same. The Shema, as it's called, is quoted in the 112th surah, the 112th chapter of the Quran, which says uh, that there is uh, one God, and that God isn't begotten, that he is absolute, uh, that he doesn't have a son, that he doesn't have offspring, and there is nothing like unto him. And this fits in very, this is the same, the same theology as we read in Deuteronomy 6.4, that Jesus himself endorses or repeats, even according to Mark, this is the first commandment. Hero uh, Israel, the Shema is the word for here in Hebrew. Hero Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. That's repeated and endorsed in the Quran itself, in Surah 112. You can read it for yourself. So Jesus, Moses and Muhammad are all in agreement on what is the, the supreme belief, what we must believe. We must believe in the oneness of God, the unity of God, but not that God has partners that he begets or is begotten. The Quran explicitly says, refuting the Christian creed, the Nicene Creed, which is recited in your Orthodox Church at every Mass, I have to know. Um, the Quran rejects that and says, no, there's nothing like unto God. That he does not beget, is not begotten, and, uh, and that he is one. And that's actually the Shema, that's what, the, that's what Moses taught, Jesus reaffirmed that, the Quran agrees and affirms that as well. These are the witnesses stacked up on one side. And then you have your church which says, well no, actually, he's three. <laughs> and Jesus is begotten of the Father. So do we go with Moses, Jesus and Muhammad, or do we go with your church? This is the choice. I give you the, the Jewish Samar in Deuteronomy, I give you Jesus' teaching in the Gospels, I give you the Quran in Surah 112, or your church, which says, no, we believe that God is three in one, not just one, and that in some way God begets begat his son, begotten his son. So the choice is yours, you make up your own mind. I'll, I'll, go, with, I'll go with Moses, I'll stick with Moses, I'll stick with Jesus, I'll stick with Muhammad, upon whom be peace. You, you, ha you can have your religion if you want, no, no one's forcing you. The Quran also says, actually, very important verse to know, there is no compulsion in religion. There's no compulsion, that's actually a statement in the Quran. And Christians often say, oh, well that was revealed in Mecca, where Muhammad was weak, uh, and uh, Muhammad wasn't, didn't have a state then, he couldn't force belief at the point of a sword and all that jazz. It's actually not true. That is a, a Medinan verse, it's a much later verse, this, there is no compulsion, where Muhammad was head of state in Medina, and this verse was revealed then that there should be no compulsion in religion. Not earlier on when he was 
well, he might be expected to say something like that. No, 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 it was revealed in the second stage of his career, if you like, in Medina. Yeah. So Islam says there's no compulsion, but you, you make up your own mind. Yeah, well, I appreciate you taking your time. No worries. Anyway, it's uh, a delightful source